Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Subrata Ashe. I am a principal software engineer at Salesforce, focusing on performance of distributed systems. I've been working on NoSQL databases for quite a long time. And in this talk, I will be giving a walkthrough on the major optimizations that we did in Cassandra and how we made it performant in our journey towards cloud native architecture. Uh, we will also look into our Cassandra work in Kubernetes containers uh, when we enabled strict encryption and were able to easily port to any cloud provider, uh, which was the goal we aim to achieve. In the agenda for today, uh, I will be briefly touching upon our WCRM use case, uh, which uh, we optimized for our Cassandra functionality, the major performance goals, uh, how we identified uh, bottlenecks and some key optimizations. The optimizations would be specific to cloud native workload with a special focus on cost to serve. However, uh, it can be generalized for data center deployments and across uh, other areas as well. Uh, moving on, uh, uh, for our use case, uh, we have Cassandra deployment uh, as a cluster in our Tableau CRM. Uh, Tableau CRM, which is formerly known as Einstein Analytics, is the analytics product that empowers Salesforce CRM users with AI-driven analytics. We use Cassandra as a primary metadata store in our distributed systems. A uh, stack serving multi-tenancy. Our Cassandra workload consists of deterministic writes in terms of scheduled batch jobs and random reads uh, due to real-time query calls to fetch metadata. In terms of deployment, uh, we are cloud native uh, with three availability zones and we route traffic using Cassandra containers which are encrypted both at rest as well as in transit. Due to the complex implementation of Cassandra, both in terms of containerization and encryption, we set some performance and reliability goals, which we will currently look into. Uh, these goals follow our existing data center cluster uh, performance, and we wanted to make sure that Cassandra is faster than our existing performant physical data center deployment. Uh, we set an optimistic P95 read write latency of less than two milliseconds and ensure that it is in parity with existing data center clusters in terms of transaction throughput and peak smoothness. Our availability goal was to achieve uh, five nines availability consisting considering in transit encryption overheads as well. Uh, the next section we will discuss on how we identified bottlenecks and what were the important parts of uh, performance analysis. So some of the key considerations in identifying bottlenecks were uh, production uh, optimization in terms of uh, simulating the workload. Uh, we started with production simulation, which includes identifying the workload, creating tables and schema based on production use case and accounting for fault tolerance and availability. With increased adoption of cloud infrastructure, Customers wanted their data to be secure and reliable. Uh, this brings in encryption of the layers where the data reside and data moves. Uh, from a performance perspective, encryption forms a major overhead uh, to overall DB response latency. Uh, and in this context, we actually did a benchmarking and comparative analysis with respect to various proxy solutions that are available. Uh, uh, the next topic that we would be covering is uh, metrics, uh, which is uh, one of the important identifiers for bottleneck. Uh, we need to find what is the right metric to monitor and alert on. Uh, we do not want to overwhelm the system with too many metrics, nor create gaps in monitoring that can lead to higher mean time to respond and to resolve. 
at the end, we will uh, have a look into the strategy around tooling and frameworks which are needed to monitor and profile Cassandra. Uh, it starts with Node tool at a very high level uh, to deep dive perf events, flame charts, and look into the kernel level performance on how Cassandra impacts uh, at the kernel level. Uh, these complements each other and helps in faster root cause analysis. So uh, in, as I spoke uh, in the previous slide, uh, production workload simulation is an important part of finding bottlenecks. Uh, it can be done using isolated Cassandra tests or by utilizing the existing application logic that is used in production. Uh, based on the experience, uh, performance issues detected using isolated tests may not always be a problem uh, in a distributed system. That's why uh, we preferred production simulations to uncover major bottlenecks and then go for isolated tests for fine tuning. Uh, we use uh, proper resource governance models as well, and our uh, uh, load generators are allowed to distribute requests through the app servers instead of directly hitting the Cassandra nodes. Here I have shown a representative high-level architecture of our workload and how we modeled it. So basically, we have in a uh, since it was a cloud-native design, we created our performance tool for testing Cassandra uh, inside a VPC where we have our load generators. Uh, we directly hit the application server, uh, which in turn communicated with the Cassandra uh, nodes. We made it sure that our request kind of hits all the application servers in a load balanced and fairly balanced manner so that all the Cassandra nodes are, uh, are getting the read and write request in a fair and a reliable manner. Uh, this gives us uh, more insights into how the system behaves under load, as well as what happens when we bring down certain set of Cassandra nodes in a specific availability zone and see the impact on the rest of it. So a single workload model, as well as a uh, performance framework design helped us achieve multiple goals. Uh, In the next slide, uh, we will sorry about that. Uh, in the next slide, we will talk about encryption overhead in Cassandra. One of the key considerations in uh, identifying the bottleneck was uh, we had to encrypt the data both at rest as well as in transit, and we wanted to make sure that none of the customer data is sent as plain text or resides in plain text. Uh, this makes encryption a little bit harder to analyze as well as to account for in the overall end-to-end -end response latency. It also makes uh, uh, things complicated in terms of root cause analysis, uh, both in the latency as well as in the availability. Uh, we know for sure that encryption does add substantial over it, and our goal was not to make it Sorry, our goal was to make it manageable under stress. Uh, we did a comparative analysis across different proxies, such as Envoy, Istio. Uh, we even tried native MTLS and found out that uh, native MTLS, which is provided by Cassandra, uh, shows highest degradation in 99th percentiles uh, latency in both read and write. And it kind of exponentially rises uh, when the system is under stress. Uh, we tested it both for FIPS as well as non-FIPS mode. And uh, looking into the uh, data, I uh, have a representation here uh, wherein uh, we look into the native MTLS in Cassandra and see how it degrades uh, with increased stress to 100,000 read-write requests per second. And uh, it shows that the P99 moves to somewhere around nine seconds, uh, which is a kind of a uh, severe degradation uh, based on our use case. 
in the next section, uh, we discuss on the metrics. Uh, sorry, I didn't see the chat yet, uh, but seems like uh, some of you have trouble in loading the screen. Uh, please let me know if you are able to see my slides. I would kind of give a couple of minutes pause here just to make sure that everyone uh, can see my slide and hear me properly. Okay, thank you so much for confirming. Uh, moving on, uh, uh, the next section we discuss on what metrics we need to identify these bottlenecks in Cassandra. Now, one of the things that we have seen is Cassandra provides a lot of metrics in terms of either node tool or in terms of its JMX uh, exposure. Uh, one of the things that comes up is whether we need to go for depth of the metric or we need to go with the breadth of the metric. Uh, in a sense, like, do we need all the metrics that are there and come up with a visualization or we should focus on certain key metrics that helps us to resolve the root cause or to fix the root cause in a faster and more reliable way. Uh, what happens is with the workload simulation and when we pivot around the encryption, uh, we look into a large set of metrics which we need to collect along with the metrics that are exposed by encryption and it's kind of becomes a real challenge in terms of visualizing and doing correlation analysis on top of it uh, we wanted to make sure that we are listening to metrics which are useful for us and also useful for debugging we do not want to listen to metric which we don't know what it monitors for if we can arrive at the root cause and resolve it using an efficient list of metrics then that answers our question for whether we should go for depth or breadth in the metrics another important aspect uh, being alerting and interval of monitoring uh, the lower the granularity of the metric the better responsiveness or better alerting capabilities we can get but a downside will be we will be getting too much of alerts along with a lot of false positives. So in order to reduce those false positives and alert, we came up with some of the key Cassandra metrics and a uh, stable frequency in which we wanted to get these metrics uh, monitored. And some of the key Cassandra metrics that we monitored for our uh, cloud native performance initiative are related to compaction pending tasks, uh, garbage collection elapsed time, compaction throughput, uh, successful read repairs, pending read write in both small, large, and gossip message pools, SS table counts per table, SS table compaction ratio, thread pool requests, max tombstones per slide, and overall read and write latencies. One of the things uh, that uh, we looked into was these were all specific to the application layer. We had a different set of metrics that we also uh, exposed from the system layer so that we can do a correlation analysis when a garbage collection elapse time uh, decreases by X percentages. Uh, we can correlate it whether it is due to some memory over it or due to some heap over it in the system or in the JDK layer. So we looked into, uh, like we kind of segregated metrics, top metrics that we need from application layer, system layer, platform layer, and infrastructure. And then we created a correlation model to find out where the thing needs more analysis or needs most optimization. The next section, which is kind of really important and one of the most interesting sections here is tooling. We decided on tools that has minimal performance over it and use automated profiling that would start with a specific threshold when it was breached. 
as part of this, we also benchmark preserve frame pointers to measure its impact on CPU latencies before enabling it for JVM profiling. So one of the key considerations that we have seen over the internet is uh, there are suggestions and articles saying that enabling uh, preserved frame pointers does not have any overhead. But what we have found is based on our experience and based on the use case that we support, uh, which is kind of a mixed workload with uh, really long spikes that happens every other hour. Uh, preserved frame pointer does add a lot of uh, overhead when the system is under stress and when the cluster is of really uh, when the cluster is small because that uh, node gets heavily uh, overwhelmed by in enabling preserved frame pointers and that becomes a really challenging task for us to do automated profiling uh, because it's that time when we wanted to have when uh, nodes actually breach the threshold and we wanted to initiate uh, automated profiling and one of the necessary conditions for CPU profiling is to have preserved frame pointer so that we can generate the uh, Java maps for efficient analysis. So apart from that, uh, 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 as I mentioned in the first few slides, our goal was also to achieve uh, pipelines of availability. Uh, so we analyze the entire Cassandra stack from application, system, platform, and infrastructure. Uh, we used all of different tools which are uh, which are giving us the right information at the right time. And some of the tools that we considered were uh, MTR for internal latency measurements, CAS test, which is part of the BCC tools. Uh, for page cache performance, uh, we used perf and DPF traces for CPU profiling and also used uh, Cassandra's native SQL tracing for knowing bottlenecks in every stage of query execution. Uh, now, since we already had an existing performant Cassandra running in production, we used the same configurations for our cloud deployment as well. However, due to the earlier complexities, we soon hit bottlenecks in terms of read and write latencies. We invested in analyzing the areas that can optimize the latency and also reduce the cost to serve. Uh, our main goal was to optimize the IOPS and also to reduce the cost to serve uh, without jeopardizing the performance of the cluster. Uh, we invested in areas where we can uh, have big optimizations that can be achieved in a very easier manner and also that can directly or indirectly result in IO improvements as well as latency improvements. Uh, this made us to invest time in analyzing hotspots in both write workload as well as read workloads and uh, we looked into uh, the impact of commit logs and SS-table usage in EBS and other network-level block stories. In the first section, let's talk about how we looked into the optimizing IOPS and cost to serve. On a high level, the response latency is, uh, I would say, like cost to serve for a disk is directly related to response latency and IOPS. What we did is that we divided the entire path, write path in Cassandra into multiple sections and looked into possible hotspots in each and every section to find out where we can optimize cost or where we can improve the IO throughput. What uh, we figured out is, and that's also generally available in Cassandra readme, is uh, Cassandra uses, uh, during write path, it uses its mem tables, uh, but it also uses disk to store the commit log and the SS tables after it is flushed. Uh, uh, however, after the mem tables are flushed to disk, the commit logs are discarded. However, commit logs play an important part 
when the node becomes down and we wanted to replace the commit log to arrive at the earlier state when the node was all good. So we looked into possibilities on how we can optimize commit logs and where the bottlenecks would reside. So based on that, we did our workload analysis and I would be going over some of the hotspots uh, that we found out in our probes and how we um, uh, found these hotspots also, I will kind of go a little bit uh, in detail as well. So one, one of the hotspots that we found out during our mid workload under heavy stress where uh, we were seeing uh, more than 10x to 20x increase in the traffic in certain hour of the day, we noticed that TCP send message uh, in Netty, which uh, Cassandra uses a lot for internode communications, uh, is showing hotspot for both large and small messages. Uh, we deep dive into Cassandra code to figure out what's happening there. And one of the things that we uh, figured out that it's related to certain uh, kernel level parameters which needs to be tuned. So in turn, we looked into the sysctl to figure out which kernel uh, parameters kind of help in minimizing the impact of TCP send messages. A uh, couple of things that we did there was to increase the TCP keep alive timeouts. We also increased the window size as well. And that really helped us in uh, making sure that this hotspot is resolved. Uh, in order to find out how this hotspot is, we used perf record. However, we created a probe uh, called TCP send message, which filters all the bytes that are greater than 1024. So that gives us a pretty much good idea that whether we are targeting for small messages or large messages. And uh, the perf record gave, gave us a very nice uh, uh, insight into how TCP send message was impacting it. We looked into then when we did a detailed profiling using DPF traces, that's when we figured out the entire code path on how it is happening and where we should optimize it. The next hotspot that we found out was related to code generation during compile time. And uh, this is not something that everyone would be facing, but this was kind of one of the rare cases that we found out was causing a lot of trouble for us when we were restarting the nodes or when we were rebootstrapping a node. Uh, we saw an exponential degradation in quick sort method uh, in the kernel during compile time. And uh, that was specifically happening during code generation of the compiled event. Uh, based on the thread stack, uh, what we found out that it's related to the amount of data that we are keeping in the table. We looked into possible optimizations across uh, how we can change the schema and make sure that the data is properly distributed across SS tables. We looked into a schema redesign where uh, we added row caching. We also partitioned the data and added more clustering uh, so that the data is properly balanced. Uh, the other important thing which uh, we kind of uh, visited a, on a higher level in the previous slide was commit logs uh, performance impact. Uh, we looked into the entire write path and saw that commit logs actually slow down during linear load. And uh, the writing to commit log is actually a lot slower than writing to the disk. And we don't want the commit logs, although the commit logs are in parallel, they don't affect the write performance. However, they were affecting the reliability during heavy load where the writes were getting queued uh, in the commit logs. And one of the hotspots that you see, you can see this kind of yeah, the image is a little bit smaller, but uh, uh, from the color coding of the image, you can see the commit logs with all the code path that were 
uh, executed by comic clubs they had pretty big and expensive operations which kind of consumed a lot of cpu resources and how we resolved it is we split the cassandra logging and storing locations to separate volumes and we guaranteed them certain iops because in uh, cloud native architecture we had uh, volumes which are network attached plus we had volumes which are directly attached to the operating system which had guaranteed iops so we wanted to make sure that the commit logging is done on a separate volume the ss tables are on a separate volume and we persist the commit logs even the cassandra node is down by backing up the commit logs at regular intervals so that we maintain the durability which we needed and which is actually provided by the commit logs and also had a better iops because now we are not um, uh, writing to commit logs on the same disk we also implemented a disk optimization strategy for ssds although we were using um, ssds uh, but somehow since uh, the default uh, disk optimization strategy was kind of having the value as hdd uh, we also look into optimizing changing that to ssd and that also brought in some level of uh, latency improvements the other important thing that we changed was setting the trickle f sync to true so that uh, whenever f sync happens or whenever uh, there is a flush to the disk uh, it's it does not queue up in the kernel and uh, the f sync is faster and it's better instead of doing a f sync on a like a larger f sync on a shorter period of time than doing smaller f syncs at regular intervals so trickle f sync guaranteed us in making sure that uh, our f syncs are really fast now uh, the next section uh, we will talk about how we optimize latencies so as i visited earlier we had uh, three availability zones which since we used cloud native solution we had three availability zones with multiple cassandra nodes per zone uh, we had a workload which is variable read and write uh, what we found out was how we can reduce the network bandwidth across all these latencies all these sorry, all these availability zones and uh, network bandwidth is also one of the important drivers for cost to serve reiterating our design pattern uh, that we run three availability zones uh, we experimented with the center compression configurations to find out which algorithm and what kind of parameters are optimal uh, we also had an experimental uh, fork of cassandra to test it with broadly compression just to see whether that really helps us or not in level 11 however based on all this testing we settled with internode compression oh sorry uh, it looks like some of you are having some issues with the audio uh, let me know if uh, i don't see a problem in my end but please let me know if you are still having a lag and i can uh, revisit some of the slides later as well uh, yeah coming back to the latency aspect uh, uh, we experimented uh, with a lot of different solutions and we settled with uh, internode uh, compression uh, commit logs and hint compression all set to lz4 as that compression helped us to reduce the payload size in a much faster manner than other compressions like snappy or uh, broadly uh, this helped us in reducing the network bandwidth cost by 2x to 3x and that's one of the major optimizations that we felt was helping us in uh, improving the latencies 
all of these optimization and many more, uh, which I could not cover due to the lack of time, helped us to successfully launch our cloud native implementation of Cassandra. And uh, this is currently productized at Salesforce Hyperforce platform. And uh, all of these were kind of focused more on Cassandra 3.11 because when we did the implementation, Cassandra 4 was not available. However, since Cassandra 4 is available now, we try to do the same kind of analysis in with Cassandra 4. And the initial performance assessment that we had for Cassandra migration to V4 in Kubernetes containers shows both upsides and downsides as well with V4. Some of the good things that we uh, look that we achieved in uh, Cassandra 4 is better lead, read latencies and the distribution of read latencies are not varied as compared to 3.11, which you can see from this specific charts uh, on read latency comparisons. Uh, these are histogram distributions and the read latencies are grouped into uh, millisecond ranges starting from zero milliseconds to 16 seconds. And since we have 17 seconds of read time on, uh, similar read latency grouping is uh, for V4 starting from 0 to 4 seconds. In Cassandra 4, we are looking into very closely clustered reads across 1 second to 4 seconds, or I would say uh, 200 milliseconds to 1 second is when the reads are mostly happening. However, majority, all of the reads are clustered from 2 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds to 4 seconds. Whereas in 3.11, our read latencies were varied from 200 milliseconds to 16 seconds, where some of these higher reads were kind of causing a lot of uh, problems for the user as well, or for the platform to respond. Uh, in terms of Cassandra community, uh, there has been immense support from the Cassandra community in our journey to cloud native. Uh, I would especially like to thank Jeremy, whose guidance has been invaluable in optimizing our cluster. And uh, it's been a very smooth and challenging journey for us to optimize and make sure Cassandra operates with strict encryption, both at rest as well as in transit uh, for all of the Salesforce customers that we serve for in WCRM. That brings us to the end of my presentations. Uh, I would kind of like to hear from you. If uh, you guys have any questions, uh, feel free to post it in the channel and I would try to answer them. Okay, I think, yeah, uh, uh, I don't see any questions as of now, but feel free to reach out to me. I have my email at the start of the presentation. Okay, I see a question. Uh, did you get any help from DevOps guy from your team in evaluation process? Uh, yes, we did. Uh, DevOps helped us in uh, implementing the monitoring and the alerting framework for us and also in a uh, quick rollout of certain experimental changes that we did. Uh, they were uh, very reliable partners for us uh, in our uh, Cassandra journey to the cloud. What was the most challenge in your journey? Yeah, one of the major challenges in our journey is uh, security approvals. Uh, we, when we experimented with Cassandra for uh, when we did some experimental analysis on uh, when we were facing issues with some of the areas where Cassandra 3.11 was not performant. Uh, we did certain 
changes in the code and forked it from the main Cassandra repo. But it took us a lot of time in getting the approvals for it in terms of security uh, approvals. And that's kind of was a big uh, roadblock for us in order to quickly test out features from a performance engineering perspective. Yep, uh, in terms of benchmarking for different uh, encryptions at rest and during transport, uh, we did a lot of comparative analysis. One of the things that we kind of outrightly rejected is uh, native MTLS support from Cassandra, which was kind of degrading under stress. However, since uh, when we moved to cloud native, we looked into Serpishmas architecture. That's what uh, our platform is based on. Uh, that's why we moved to uh, using Istio and Envoy proxy there. Uh, the other thing that we look in terms of uh, encryption at rest, we rely both on kernel full disk encryption, which uses the KCryptD and the crypto APIs. We also uh, built our solution on top of the already available vendor specific full disk encryption as well. Uh, do you run multiple Cassandra pods per Kubernetes node, or is it one-to-one? -one? Yes, we do uh, run multiple Cassandra pods per Kubernetes node. Uh, we also have clusters where we run one Kubernetes pod having multiple Cassandra nodes. Uh, how do you set your resource and limits configuration? Uh, yes, uh, uh, when we uh, we set our resource and limits configuration using the general Kubernetes mapping of uh, setting the CPU and memory uh, limits, uh, both hard and soft. However, uh, as since our uh, use case of Cassandra is just for metadata storage, we don't store blobs or we don't store very large files. We didn't have any issues as of today with uh, CFS or with throttling. However, we saw issues with throttling uh, when we integrated it with our encryption module, but the throttling was more related to the encryption process rather than Cassandra. Okay, it looks like we are nearing the end of the session. If we don't have any other questions, I would kind of uh, end this uh, talk. Feel free to reach out to me at my email or you can also find me on LinkedIn. Uh, it would be kind and it would be a very great opportunity for me to discuss with other uh, Cassandra users and collaborate on things that would make Cassandra more efficient and more performant in future. Thank you, everyone, and have a rest. Good rest of the day.